So those are really great resources for you as parents or as board members or teachers to catch the vision of classical education. And uh, that's what this event is about. That's what SCOLA is about. We want to uh, host a series of events that are designed to encourage you uh, with a vision for Christian education. And that is uh, our, our slogan is that it's a life worth learning because this is uh, the kind of an education that shouldn't end in a 12th grade or in college. Uh, it's the kind of education that's not only useful for preparing you for college or for a career, but for your whole life. And that means for eternity. So that's the, that's the end goal here, the end game. And that's why I want to talk to you about noble and free. Um, we subtitled this, What Are We Teaching Your Children? But I'm actually not going to talk very much about curriculum. So for that, you, you have to ask your child's teachers and ask uh, the, the principal and the board members. Um, I could talk about that, but it'd be long and dull. And there are people who know their curriculum better than me since uh, I joined this school in 2004, and they've never yet let me out of the Latin department. So, <laughs> so I, don't get to, I don't get to teach much else. Um, but uh, we, uh, well, and I don't mind teaching the Latin, actually. I've, I've been here teaching it because I love it. But if I could teach something else, it would be to teach you what I have for you tonight. Um, I want you to know that this kind of an education is all geared uh, towards teaching your children to see themselves uh, as noble and free, immortal souls that are designed uh, to fulfill God's purpose, and it's a big one. So I'm going to be giving you the general overview of what a classical education is and what it does. Um, these pictures here are taken from the Birmingham Art Museum. I was wandering through there one day and saw these. They're, they're larger and more beautiful. They're two long panels. They're two sides, two side panels of a chest. It was originally a, a wedding gift to a bride. And these two panels are the two sides of the chest, and they represent two sides of the same coin. Uh, they're, they're lovely. And when I stumbled upon them, at first I didn't know what they meant. They're, they're clearly allegorical. They're full of all kinds of symbols. And I wasn't sure I could read them, but as I looked at it longer, I realized, oh, look at this is an allegory that's all about classical education. And it started me doing a lot of research, and I found out a lot of really fascinating things. That's what I want to share with you tonight. Start here with um, a quote from Cicero. And by the way, most of, the, most of what you have in your handout are the quotes. There's space for you to take some notes. Uh, there's some terms I'm going to define, and you might want to write that down. But mostly what you find there are these quotations. These are gold. Uh, if I could give you anything, um, it's these quotations because they help to show you what we're trying to do and, and what we want for your child. So here Cicero, who's a Roman, said, I think no one ought to be numbered among the orators who's not polished in all those arts that are proper for a free citizen. And we don't necessarily understand all that he's saying there, so let's define some terms. Uh, what's an orator? Uh, what does he mean by art? And you can see my heading, the seven liberal arts. What is that? That sounds pretty hokey. Uh, so let's talk about these. Uh, first of all, when Cicero says art, he, means, uh, he doesn't mean self-expression uh, with pastels and crayons. Um, he means any kind of skill. Uh, so this word... Uh, that Cicero is using even refers to technical skills uh, like we would use to describe uh, the, the skill of a, a computer programmer, uh, the skill of an engineer, mathematical skills, not just uh, the, the uh, graphic arts. Um, liberal, in its old sense, its proper sense, meant free or, or uh, generous, uh, and that's what we that's what we want to give your children is an education in uh, what is noble and generous. And we want them to become noble and generous, and we want them to be like free citizens. This is uh, connected to the same word, liberty, that we all know. Uh, that's come into the English language. So when Cicero says that no one should be numbered among the orators who's not polished in all those arts that are proper for a free citizen, um, 
he's talking about the sorts of things for free men and women and not for slaves, for people who are made to rule and to have leadership and authority. And that's important to remember because if you're a Christian, no education will do except an education that fits you for freedom and authority because that's our calling in Christ. We have freedom from sin and death. We have freedom from slavery. And we are called to have dominion over the creation and exercise our authority for the glory of God. So no other kind of education can really cut it if you're a Christian. Now, Cicero wasn't a Christian, which is fascinating. Um, and classical education, as we do it here at this school, is really two things. There's the classical part, which we've inherited from ancient Greeks and Romans, and there's the Christian part. What's interesting is when Christianity became dominant in the Western world, uh, the great leaders of Christendom did not throw out the old pagan schema of education. They said, this will do because it educates free citizens, and we want free citizens. Um, the last term there, the orator, we're, we're used to the idea of a public speaker, but public speakers, we don't, they don't carry a lot of weight with us. They charge large fees to do very little. Uh, they speak at occasions. They speak at the openings of presidential libraries. Uh, that doesn't really resonate with us or seem very important, but trust me, we want your child to be an orator. An orator, in the sense Cicero is using it, means a statesman, uh, a leader within the state or within the community. And I think that even though some people have better, you know, other gifts, uh, we, we each have our own gifts, um, it is good for Christians to be in leadership. And if we can train our children to be leaders and to exercise their authority as leaders for the blessing of their communities, then we've done our job well. And so we do want to make your children orators. And you'll notice, uh, even probably as early as second grade, they've got to stand up and give reports. And by senior year, they're writing a thesis that they have to present publicly and defend to a panel. And this is all designed to make them orators who are capable of expressing themselves capable of, um, of influencing public opinion, and all in the service of Christ. Let's move on here a little bit. The parts of the, the seven liberal arts, and you may have heard these, uh, there's seven, they're divided three and four. Three of them are language arts. We call them the trivium. There you see them, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Boy, we're tired of those terms around here, aren't we? <laughs> we hear them so many times. Uh, we use them to describe so many things. Um, here, I want you to understand what's meant by those studies. Uh, and St. Bonaventure, who is a, a bishop uh, from Portugal, wrote a fantastic little book called Tracing the Arts Back to Theology, where he shows that all studies have their, their source and their culmination in, in God. And he, he begins by saying we've got these three language arts. Grammar teaches us to express the truth. And logic teaches us to think truthfully. Uh, we're able to make correct judgments. But rhetoric, rhetoric is the, is the cream of the crop because rhetoric allows us the skill, gives us the skill to persuade other people of the truth. Once again, you can see why Christian thinkers didn't want to throw out this classical scheme of education. What could be better? The picture, though, is worth a thousand words. Here you see logic, rhetoric, and grammar. Grammar is on the right. And you can see near her, um, oh, I should explain, these three ladies here represent the arts. And beneath them, the smaller figures of men represent those um, authors or thinkers who are the best exemplars of those skills. Um, and grammar over there on the, your left is by a gate. That's because grammar is the gateway to learning. The gr grammar is all about language and literacy. And if you can't read and write, uh, how will you persuade anyone of the truth? Your resources will be cut short. How will you learn many things? How will you master many disciplines if you can't read and write? This is the gateway of all learning, very important. And that's why also there are two children here in the picture who've come to see grammar so that they can be educated and uh, She's holding what looks like a rod, but if you look more closely, if you go down to the art museum, look at it, you'll see it's actually a whip. 
That's because this stage of learning is very painful. It is painful to learn to read and write, but it's worthwhile, and it gives us better things. Over on your left, we see logic, and in the center there is rhetoric. Rhetoric is about to speak. She's also holding a scroll, because rhetoric is not just speaking, it's also written communication. If you ever wonder why we read pagans like Homer, his Iliad and Odyssey, or we read about Egyptian gods, here's one reason why. This is a Christian named Ermenric of Elvangen, uh, who lived in the 800s, and he says, essentially, that those things have their proper place, just like manure does. You don't want manure in the house, but on your garden it's a good thing. And it's a good thing to gain what you can learn from the pagans, uh, even people who didn't glorify God, and then learn, learn how to use those skills rightly, just as they use them wrongly. Martin Luther wrote a letter to the uh, churches of Germany in which he called for them to maintain schools. And he said, uh, he essentially took them to task and said, you're not, you're not doing enough, you're not doing anything to see that your children are educated, and it's not just a matter of economics. He actually says to them, uh, don't tell me that your children are going to learn a trade and be apprenticed in a trade and they're going to be able to make money and that's enough. He says that is not enough. Not if you're a Christian. It's not enough. It's good. It's necessary. But you need something more. And so he even calls for specifically studying Greek, Latin, uh, and Hebrew so that those children would have uh, a full range of the scriptures and all the wisdom contained in them and commentaries written about them. And here he says, let us be sure of this, we shall not long preserve the gospel without the languages. The languages are the sheath in which the sword of the Spirit is contained. They are the casket in which we carry this jewel. They are the vessel in which we hold this wine. They are the larder in which this food is stored. If, through our neglect, we let the languages go, which may God forbid, we shall not only lose the gospel, but come at last to the point where we shall be unable to speak or write correct Latin or German. That's a sacrifice I'm not prepared to make. And so that's why one reason why we teach Latin. But it bothers me that we only teach Latin at Evangel. I would really like to have us teaching Greek and Hebrew. But we've got to work, we've got to work up to it. So if any of you have those skills, <laughs> come talk to me. But what about STEM? Um, the quadrivium is the next four of the seven liberal arts. These are all mathematical arts. When we look at them, we say, okay, this looks pretty normal. And then we say, wait a minute, there's a lot of things that we would consider science or mathematics that are not in here. Uh, we don't see biology. We don't see physics. We don't see calculus or algebra. The, the ancients were not um, limiting all learning to seven subjects. In fact, there are ancient authors who said there should be nine, there should be 12. There's one who expands the list to 23. They would not be opposed to the new things that we've discovered, but this was what they had to work with mostly, and so this is what they give as a normal list. Uh, arithmetic, which is basic number properties. Uh, music, uh, which they said was important because the whole universe is harmoniously created and constructed, and if the whole universe is created this way by God, so that everything fits together in perfect diversity and unity, uh, then we also should learn how to imitate that. And one of the best ways to do it is music, in which you have a range of different notes, different instruments, different parts, and yet they all fit together to make one glorious whole. Uh, geometry and astronomy, of course. Let's look at the picture. Here we can see each of the arts holding the tools that are proper uh, to them, and then some exemplars. We've got Pythagoras over there on the left. I'm sure in that book he has his theorem. We have Euclid, who if you go and look at the art museum, you'll see that the book he's holding has geometric shapes on it, circles and squares and triangles, because Euclid uh, pretty much uh, is the founder of geometry. The, he wasn't the first one, but he's the first one to express it uh, and write it out for us. Um, Interesting story about why Tubal Cain, you'll have to look at uh, him in the book of Genesis if you want to know why he's listed for music. And then there's Abraham. Now, in the panel of the seven liberal arts, and we're looking at slightly more than half of it right here, the center art 
and so the most important one is astronomy. Now you'll look at the legend above it and you'll see astronomy is pointing at and looking at the stars. You also see it says astrologia. That's just because the difference between astronomy and astrology, using those terms to differentiate two different things, didn't, didn't occur at the time of this um, painting. Later on, uh, scientists decided they wanted to separate themselves uh, from the astrologists. Uh, but at the time this was painted, there was one study, astrologia, which means the law of the stars, and there were just people who studied the stars uh, and understood them, and then there were people who tried uh, perversely to use that to control uh, their fates, their future, uh, witchcraft essentially, what we now call astrology. So don't be bothered by the legend. It doesn't really mean astrology as we mean it now. Um, and we have Abraham as an exemplar. You can see he's holding a book, he's got a pen, and he's prepared to number the stars. Mm -hmm. So there's a very long tradition that states that it was Abraham who's the founder of astronomy because he went out and numbered the stars. Obviously, that's extra biblical, but it's worth hearing. Um, St. Augustine makes an interesting point about these scientific or more mathematical arts in his little book on Christian doctrine, which was intended to help pastors uh, learn to write sermons. And he actually asks the question, should we, should we gather anything from the pagans if we have everything we need in Scripture? He says, We've, what good is a golden key if a wooden one will do the trick? Uh, and and why, why should we go look to the pagans when we can find everything fully and more perfectly expressed in Scripture? Uh, I would encourage you to read his book because he answers that question with good arguments. And he, and he draws some lines. He says, this is useful to us. We should pay attention to it. This isn't so much. But when he gets to the numerical sciences, the quadrivium, he says, coming now to the science of number, it is plain to the dullest apprehension that this was not created by man but was discovered by investigation. In other words, astronomy and the mathematical sciences give us a very pure glimpse into the wisdom and glory of God because they aren't corrupted by man. They're not mixed in with other things. They're not mixed in with false stories of gods and goddesses. Uh, numbers work the way they do there's always a right answer, and uh, that's because of the way that God designed the universe. So it's, it's almost like a pure, uncorrupted glimpse of God's wisdom, and that's what St. Augustine wants to point out. And so he says, of course, we should study the mathematical arts you know, when he makes his case in this book. But um, we have a problem. This is all well and good. Uh, that we have this idea of seven arts that all fit together into a perfect whole and we want our children, think back to Cicero, to be polished in all those arts. So they've got to know all this stuff um, and they're going to use it to persuade other people of the truth. That's all well and good, but that's not the kind of education you and I got, is it? Probably not. Most of us probably experienced education as something uh, something in between waiting in the doctor's room or the doctor's waiting room for 12 years or being in prison camp. And at the end of it, uh, we, we, we may have gotten a piece of paper that enabled us to start a career. Um, and probably along the way, you got to hear lots of teachers, some good and some bad, who would all stand up and say that their subject was the most important. Uh, I always hear this from our alumni when they come back from college to visit. I'll say, tell me about your classes. Tell me what you're learning. And I'd love to hear what they're up to. And, and it's always interesting. There's always one professor. There's always one professor who will tell the students that all the other arts, all the other studies are really a crock. And the really most important thing is fill in the blank, whatever it is that is the professor's specialty. Uh, so that we have a kind of war going on between the teachers or professors or experts in different fields and they argue with one another. We have this split between the arts and the humanities uh, that says, well, science is about facts and uh, literature is, you know, just a bunch of made up uh, worthless stuff. So this is, this is a problem. This is not the way the ancients saw learning. So this, that's not really a classical education mindset. So what's gone wrong? And uh, furthermore, it, it shows itself in one other really uh, bad thing, I think, which is that more and more we hear our, our, um, 
our government leaders and those who are in charge of setting educational programs and standards talking about how we need to more and more funnel our children into specialization and selecting them for a career earlier and earlier to make them an expert in only one thing. But that's totally contrary to the biblical worldview. Because if man is really made to have dominion over the creation, which is the first command that was ever was given, is to have dominion. Um, if man is really meant to be a leader, if, if we're really meant to exercise our authority and our gifts for the glory of God and for the good of his creation and to bless other people, then we can't be content only having one tool in the box. We, we should seek more. We should want more. Um, but that is not the situation we find ourselves in. Um, look at this. Uh, this is another painting. This one's not in the Birmingham Art Museum, unfortunately. Uh, it's, again, an allegory of the seven liberal arts. It's much later, uh, about 200 years later. And I just love this painting. I just want you to see the beauty. I, I just want you to see these are beautiful women, and they should be. The arts should be represented as beautiful women because wisdom is beautiful. Wisdom is good. That's why Solomon always says, wisdom, is, uh, wisdom has prepared her house. She's hewn out her seven pillars. She's prepared her banquet, and she's inviting people to come to the banquet. Uh, wisdom is a beautiful lady, and the arts are beautiful, and we should want them even the ones that are hard on us. Uh, now I know enough that I don't think I would hate uh, studying mathematics if I had a second go around. But between the fifth, uh, fifth grade and the ninth grade, I was convinced that mathematics were invented to torment me. And I was, I was not good at it, but I was also <coughs> pig-headed. Uh, I did not see that I had been called to have dominion over the creation. And I did not understand that I'd been invited by our God and by our Savior, Jesus Christ, to use my gifts to glorify Him. And so I had a very small view of what I was supposed to be doing. Um, instead of seeing the fact that I had been invited for, to, to take a kingdom, and so I should study up on that so I can have a big kingdom and run it well, I rejected mathematics and decided that they were a waste of my time and they were a torture device that had been invented by someone. It was very silly. Uh, that was my childish opinion. I didn't understand that wisdom and knowledge and all these skills and arts are beautiful and they're to be desired. Um, Robert Proctor wrote an interesting book called Defining the Humanities. He was paid by the college board to define what a, um, a humanities course or a liberal arts college is. And at the end of the study, he presented his results, and nobody could agree on them. And he wrote this book essentially to say, no one seems to agree on what the humanities are. Everything's fragmented, and there's a war between the arts and the sciences. The ancient unity of all the disciplines and areas of learning remains a powerful idea to strive for. That's the classical idea and a standard against which to measure and judge our own increasingly fragmented and incoherent curriculum in which we pull our students one way and another, uh, following one subject or area of interest and then another. It's a bad situation, but we don't have it at this school. He also says, from the Enlightenment on, science has been modernity's chief superstition. Too many people still think of science as a kind of magic, which will someday sir, solve all the world's problems. Um, science is a wonderful thing, is a good thing, but it's not everything. There's more to us than empirical data that we can measure. There's, there's uh, aspects of our personality and our mind and our character that you can't measure with surveys and metrics. President, uh, or Dr. Larry Arne, president of Hillsdale College, uh, writes this insightful statement in talking about the modern uh, fad for, uh, for funneling students into a career uh, without, uh, without giving them a broad education and for, and for um, playing up the difference between science and art and uh, humanities when he says that uh, the practical point is that America needs more technical education, more scientists and mathematicians. And of course, we do need science and math scientists and mathematicians. But I like to remind people when they say this that the word technical comes from the Greek word techne, which means art. 
And Aristotle points out that art is about making, and that the question of what one should make is always superior in point of order and logic to the question of how to make it. So our technology tells us how we can do things, but it doesn't necessarily tell us whether we should. And getting that judgment on whether we should do something requires us to listen to the other half of the curriculum, the humanities half. This is part of what prompted C.S. Lewis to say that the task of the modern educator is not to cut down jungles and build an orderly civilization uh, on empirical, scientific lines, but to irrigate deserts. That is, the children need to have something growing in them, and not just knowledge, not just knowledge, not just facts. Um, if we're made in the image of God, if we're immortal souls, then we've got to build something more than, uh, than uh, we've got to build something more than a career. We've got to build something more than technical skills. And that's why we need the virtues. So the old scheme of classical education and the one which we have made new at this school acknowledges that there's two sides to this coin. On the one hand, we want to equip your child with skills that will make them capable of many things but they will not know how to use those skills well and rightly unless we also uh, equip them in morally that they're eternal souls and we need to make sure that their hearts and their spirits are directed wisely. Quintilian was uh, another ancient Roman. He wrote a book on education and he says, here's my plan for education. We're educating that perfect orator, there's that word again, who must be a good man, and therefore we require in him not only exceptional talent for speaking, but also all of the virtues of the soul. Uh, what he actually says in the Latin is slightly different. He really says we're educating a perfect orator who, unless he's a good man, isn't an orator. He can't be a leader, a civic leader. He can't be an eloquent speaker who can persuade people of the truth unless he's good. It's not enough to speak well. And and persuade people of your opinion by deceit uh, or by manipulation, by appearing to satisfy what people want, saying what they want to hear, that's not enough. We don't just need public speakers who are skilled public speakers. We need good men and women to be public speakers. So let's talk about these virtues. Virtue sounds really namby-pamby to me. Um, it's a very, this is not a real strong word in English. Uh, I think it sounds, it smacks of uh, of a goody-goody two-shoes kind of boy who always goes to Sunday school and never gets his perfect little seersucker suit dirty. And uh, that's not what it means. Virtue comes from a root uh, connected with the word for manliness. It's a very aggressive and active kind of excellence. It can mean the excellence of an athlete. It can mean the excellence of, um, the excellence of an artist. It can mean the excellence of a soldier. It is excellence. It's very active. It's strength, and we want your children to have it. Uh, Quintilian says we want to educate the perfect orator, and that means he's got to be complete. He can't be lacking anything. And in a minute, we're going to be talking about what are called the cardinal virtues. So I just want you to see that cardinal is a word that means the hinge. The door hangs on the hinge, and uh, our character hangs on the cardinal virtues. We want your child to be complete and lacking none of these. We want him or her to be the perfect orator. These are the cardinal virtues. They're sometimes called the pagan virtues, and that's because uh, even ancient pagans acknowledged them. We've got fortitude or courage. We've got temperance. When you hear temperance, of course, you think, oh, no alcohol. But really, temperance means self-control. Uh, you have prudence, which is foresight or wisdom, practical wisdom to be able to see ahead and make judgments about what needs to be done, learn from experience, learn from the past, learn from other people's mistakes. That's prudence. And then justice, giving each person what is due to them. Now, all these are they're interesting because they all require, they all require a balance. You can have too much of any of these and too little. Too much fortitude is foolhardiness, and too little is cowardice. Temperance can go either way, drunkenness or 
being kind of a stuck-up Pharisee, you can't have a good time with anybody. Uh, and uh, prudence, you can be too careful, and you can be absolutely reckless. So all of these are a balance. Uh, they're, the strength of these virtues is in maintaining that balance. And the way they're characterized in the painting, you can see them here. Uh, they're actually on the outside of the panel, so I had to bring the two sides in there for you. They're on the outside because they're not as important as the three in the middle. On the right, we've got temperance. She's holding two pots. It's a little bit hard to see it, but one of them's got wine, one's got water, and she's mixing them. She's mixing them so that she can get just enough wine, but not too much. Fortitude is holding a pillar. I mean, we have this expression, a pillar of strength. She's got a helmet on. She's got a shield. She looks like she's ready for a fight. Justice is kind of interesting. We recognize justice, of course, by the sword and the scales, but she's not blindfolded. This is just an older idea of justice. Now we want justice to be blindfolded and not to give any preference to any person in particular. But the ancients believed, how could justice be blind? Of course, justice has to have her eyes open. Justice is not a matter of chance. Um, and then last of all is prudence, the strangest of all of them. If you look, she's holding what appears to be a bar of dial soap. Um, it's actually the philosopher's stone, which is a mythical thing that's supposed to be able to turn lead into gold. In her other hand, she's holding a snake as a symbol of wisdom because they're such cunning and crafty animals, or they had a reputation for it anyway. And... Um, Stranger still, she actually has two faces. If you can't see it here, you should go down to the Birmingham Art Museum. It's free. Go and look at it. She's got one face on the front of her head and one on the back. But that's prudence. Prudence has to be able to look ahead to see what's coming and look back to the past and learn uh, from what has already been. And again, that's part of the logic behind this classical school, is that we're always looking to the past in order to meet the challenges of the future. Here's St. Paul. He's expressing perfectly the idea of temperance, the virtue of temperance. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. What he wishes to be is free. And remember, classical education is about being noble and free. Noble because we're made in the image of God. Free because we've been set free by Christ. And how will we be free? How will we be free to study many different disciplines? How will we be free to use these skills to glorify God? How can we possibly be free for those things if we're slaves to our appetites, if we're slaves to our opinions, if we're slaves and we're captives? We can't be. So temperance is very necessary. We want to be free for action, like a soldier. And uh, one way to do that is to cultivate virtue. Now, the last three virtues in the center of the panel are the most important. They're in the center. That's one way they're shown to be the most important. And these are always called the Christian virtues. These are really interesting because the ancients, the Greeks and the Romans, never had, a, never had an inkling about these. They never talk about them. In fact, I don't think they could imagine them. Uh, these, are, these are things that were revealed by God through his prophets, uh, through his uh, scriptures, through our Savior Jesus Christ, through the apostles. Um, and so these are wholly distinct from anything we could have learned from the past. These are new and these are better. These are the crown of the virtues. Faith, which is trust in God's character, that we have confidence in Him even when we have no guarantee from Him about what the next 24 hours will bring. We can exercise our faith in Him because we know His character, we know He's good. We know he's merciful. We know he's almighty. Hope is a little bit different. When we say hope, we usually mean uh, pie in the sky. Like, oh, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. Uh, we're, we're talking about something that may or may not turn out and probably won't most of the time when we say hope. But in Scripture, uh, writers who use the word hope always refer to God's promises. And so we learn this as Christians. We only as Christians have hope. No one else can because we have promises, exceeding great and precious promises that have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Uh, knowing those gives us hope. And then love, 
uh, self-sacrifice for others, or agape love, is sometimes called. I'm going to share with you one last, uh, one last quote here on the subject of the virtues that may help you understand what to do with school. I, when I was old enough to start thinking about why I was in school, which would have been in college, I thought that I was in school in order to get a job. And I was. That's one good reason. But it can't be the only reason if we're Christians because we've got a much bigger game to play. This is a really insightful quote. It's written by Simone Weil, uh, who converted to Christianity late in life uh, and died in a concentration camp. She was a Jew, and she worked in the French Resistance, and she wrote that the key to a Christian conception of studies is the realization that prayer consists of attention. That is, you don't pray to God if you aren't already directed towards Him and looking to see what he has for you. It is the orientation of all the attention of which the soul is capable towards God. Of course, school exercises only develop a lower kind of attention towards the subject or the teacher or the problem. Nevertheless, they're extremely effective in increasing the power of attention which will be available at the time of prayer on the condition that they're carried out with a view to this purpose and this purpose alone. In other words, when your child is struggling with a, with a class, when you're struggling with a problem in business, it is an opportunity to turn all of your attention towards God and look for His help in that circumstance. And then you gain something, whether or not you solve the problem. You gain something, whether or not you're good at the class or whether or not you're able to get a good grade in it. What you've gained is that you have strengthened in your soul the tendency to look towards God and to receive assistance from God. So that even in the classroom, even in the drudgery of a subject that you might hate, even in a problem at work that you can't solve easily, where everything's against you, you have the opportunity to gain something that you will never lose. She goes on, School children and students who love God should never say, for my part, I like mathematics, or I like French, I like Greek. They should learn to like all these subjects because all of them develop that faculty of attention which directed towards God is the very substance of prayer. That striving through difficulty, that virtue of perseverance. These are the things that we need if we're going to be free and noble. And we believe, I believe, uh, that your children are noble and that they can be free in Christ. But it requires that we cultivate these virtues. Here are faith, hope, and love. Just want to point out that hope is looking out of the picture. We can't see. We can't see what she's looking at. She's waiting in expectation for a promise that hasn't come true yet. Whereas faith is looking at emblems of our, Christ's, or our Savior Jesus Christ's uh, death and passion. And we have faith in God. We have faith in His character because of what we know about him through our Savior Jesus Christ, where his love looks right out at us. She's holding the Christ child, the ultimate expression of love, and her hand is a blazing fire, because this is a virtue that can't be extinguished. What I want to tell you is, is very simple. After all this time, what I want you to know as parents and what I wish that your children could know, and what I tell them when they're in my classes, and what I tell our faculty when they'll listen to me, <laughs> is that this school, this school is so unique because it's designed to make your children noble and free, to recognize their nobility as being made in the image of God, to recognize that uh, they are noble because they have a high calling. They're, they're going to live forever, they're going to live forever. What kind of an immortal soul will they be? What, if they could be given a kingdom, what student would choose a small one? Wouldn't you want more? What if your kingdom was for the glory of God, that you were to have dominion over some small area of life, perhaps your home, your family, 
whatever authority or responsibilities you have at work, whatever gifts or hobbies or talents or expertise you have, that's your sphere in which you get to rule. And you have the opportunity not only to rule it, but also to use it to glorify God. Who wouldn't want more? And if you can get more by study, by learning many things, why wouldn't you? Even the hard subjects, even the difficult ones, even the ones that uh, made me uh, weep and take math all summer long when I was in fifth grade. <laughs> it would have been worthwhile if I had known that I could use those gifts for the glory of God and that if everything is God's, it's all fair game. Everything is fair game for us to take and use for His glory, everything that He's created. What a noble calling. What a freeing uh, and, and liberating notion of life and of education. And it frees me. It frees me from the difficulty of whatever, you know, my fifth grade self, I could have been freed from the difficulty of math. I would have recognized it instead as training, that Christ was exercising me and preparing me for something harder. I could have been free. I could have been free from anxiety in college and thinking about, oh, what am I going to do when I get out of here? How am I going to get a job? Because I would have recognized that I can, I can work in any sphere to the glory of God. There's no job I can't have, and I can pursue all the training I want. I can study anything. I can exercise any gift for God's glory. How freeing is that? Freedom from the slavery to, to these small things. Freedom for the greatest thing. Classical education is a noble education fit for kings and queens who will inherit an eternal kingdom through Christ. For an eternal nation of royal priests who must offer worthy praise to their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ throughout eternity. But what will you have to give him? How much have you got? Don't you want to have more than one tool in the box? Don't you want to have more than one gift to bring? Don't you want to have more than one crown that you can cast at his feet? What other form of education has this holy and eternal goal? And what other kind of education can provide the resources for the task? This is a great school. This is a great kind of education. It is priceless. And I'm excited about it. And that's what I wanted to tell you. That you're noble and you're free. And we want your children to be noble and free also. Thanks. Thanks.